Committee, uh, first, uh, thanks very much for your, uh, your opening statements. Um, obviously, we're here today to talk about cyber threats uh, face our nation, and I will offer uh, some brief valedictory recommendations and a few uh, parting observations. I certainly want to take note of and thank the members of the committee who are engaged on this issue and have spoken to it uh, publicly. I know there is great interest in the issue of Russian interference in our electoral process based on the many classified briefings the intelligence community has already provided on this topic to the Congress. Secretary of Homeland Security Jay Johnson and I have issued statements about it. The joint analysis report that you alluded to publicly issued by Department of Homeland Security and the Federal Bureau of Investigation provided details on the tools and infrastructure used by the Russian intelligence services to compromise infrastructure associated with the election, as well as a range of U.S. government, political, and private sector entities, as you described. As you also noted, the President tasked the intelligence community to prepare a comprehensive report on Russian interference in our election. We plan to brief the Congress and release an unclassified version of this report to the public early next week with due deference to the protection of highly sensitive and fragile sources and methods. But until then, we're really not prepared to discuss this beyond standing by our earlier statements. We are prepared to talk about other aspects of the Russian cyber threat. We also see cyber threats challenging public trust and confidence in information, services, and institutions. Russia has clearly assumed an even more aggressive cyber posture by increasing cyber espionage operations, leaking data stolen from these operations, and targeting critical infrastructure systems. China continues to succeed in conducting cyber espionage against the U.S. government, our allies, and U.S. companies. Intelligence community and, and security experts, however, have observed some reduction in cyber activity from China against U.S. companies since the bilateral September 2015 uh, commitment to refrain from espionage for commercial gain. Iran and North Korea continue to improve their capabilities to launch uh, disruptive or destructive cyber attacks to support their political objectives. Non-state actors, notably terrorist groups, most especially including ISIL, also continue to use the internet to organize, recruit, spread propaganda, raise funds, collect intelligence, inspire action by disciples, and coordinate operations. So in this regard, I wanna footstomp a few points that I've made here uh, before. Rapidly advancing commercial encryption capabilities have had profound effects on our ability to, to detect terrorists and their activities. We need to strengthen the partnership between government and industry and find the right balance to enable the intelligence community and law enforcement both to operate as well as to continue to respect the rights to privacy. Cyber operations can also be a means to change, manipulate, or falsify electronic data or information to compromise its integrity. Cyberspace can be an echo chamber in which information, ideas, or beliefs, true or false, get amplified or reinforced through constant repetition. All these types of cyber operations have the power to chip away at public trust and confidence in our information, services, and institutions. By way of some observations and recommendations, both the government and the private sector have done a lot to improve cybersecurity, and our collective security is better, but it's still not good enough. Our federal partners are stepping up their efforts with the private sector, but sharing of what they have remains uneven. I think the private sector needs to up its game on cybersecurity and not just wait for the government to provide perfect warning or a magic solution. We need to influence international behavior in cyberspace. This means pursuing more global diplomatic efforts to promulgate norms of behavior in peacetime and to explore setting limits on cyber operations against certain targets. When something major happens in cyberspace, our automatic default policy position should not be exclusively to counter cyber with cyber. We should consider all instruments of national power. 
In most cases to date, non-cyber tools have been more effective at changing our adversary's cyber behavior. When we do choose to act, we need to model the rules we want others to follow since our actions set precedence. We also need to be prepared for adversary retaliation, which may not be as surgical either due to the adversary's skill or the inherent difficulty in calibrating effect and impact of cyber tools. That's why using cyber to counter cyber attacks risks unintended consequences. We currently cannot put a lot of stock, at least in my mind, in cyber deterrence. Unlike nuclear weapons, cyber capabilities are difficult to see and evaluate and are ephemeral. It was accordingly very hard to create the substance and psychology of deterrence, in my view. We also have to take some steps now to invest in the future. We need to rebuild a tr trusted working relationships with industry and the private sector on specific issues like encryption and the roles and responsibilities for government, users, and industry. I believe we need to separate NSA and Cybercom. We should dis discontinue the temporary dual hat arrangement, which I helped design when I was Under Secretary of Defense for Intelligence seven years ago. This isn't purely a military issue. I don't believe it is an NSA's or the IC's long-term best interest to continue the dual hat setup. Third, we must hire, train, and retain enough cyber talent and appropriately fuse cyber as a whole of IC workforce. Clearly, cyber will be a challenge for the U.S., the intelligence community, and our national security for the foreseeable future, and we need to be prepared for that. Adversaries are pushing the envelope. Since this is a tool that doesn't cost much and sometimes is hard to attribute. I certainly appreciate, as we all do, the committee's interest in this difficult and important challenge. I'll wrap up by saying after 53 years in the intelligence business in one capacity or another, happily I've just got 15 days left. <laughs>